Good evening. We are delighted to present a very special and timely program this evening. For more than a year now, the world has been grappling with the fallout over COVID-19. Around this time last year, we watched as the pandemic swept like wildflower, wildfire from country to country until no place on earth was safe from the virus's reach. Faced with unprecedented challenges and unknown harms, elected officials at every level of government scrambled to keep pace with the virus's spread. Folks like Anthony Fauci went from a bureaucrat little known outside of Washington circles to one of the world's most recognizable figures. And if you're anything like me, the daily press conferences of President Trump and Governors Cuomo and Murphy were much watched TV. Every day, new infection numbers were splashed on screen, along with a seemingly endless stream of new government mandates and restrictions as our elected officials tried to get ahead of the curve. Why well, watch all this unfold as a spectator in my living room and at the expense of more than one day's lost work, our elected officials and teams of government staffers worked day and night to make sense of what was unfolding. And whether we agreed or disagreed with the policies put in place, some of which we will get to shortly, those public servants deserve our utmost gratitude and respect. Matt Placken served as New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy's first chief counsel, a position he held until September of last year. As a top legal advisor to the governor, Matt, along with the state's attorney general, were instrumental in crafting Governor Murphy's response to the pandemic. As chief counsel, Matt managed a team of over 20 lawyers in drafting, reviewing, and approving all legislation and executive administrative actions before uh, for the governor. And relevant to tonight's discussion on executive powers during times of crisis, Matt managed the drafting of over 80 executive orders and numerous administrative orders pertaining to the state's emergency response to COVID. Matt is presently a partner in the White Collar and Business Litigation Group at the law firm of Blowenstein Sandler. He is a double graduate of Stanford University, receiving both his undergraduate and his law degree from the university. And one of those fortuitous small world coincidences, Matt and Elon Warman, our other guests this evening, were classmates at Stanford. Elon running the world's premier institution dedicated to legal thought, otherwise known as the Federal Society, and Matt running that other outfit known as the American Constitution Society. If we have some time at the end, I'd love to know both of your thoughts on the mascot. <laughs> Elon Warman is a professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. He is a former attorney at Winston and Strong, and he clerked for the Honorable Jerry E. Smith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Elon is one of the nation's leading constitutional scholars and has published two books, the first titled A Debt Against the Living, an Introduction to Original Originalism, is a rich introduction to the theory of originalism thought. One reviewer remarked that it is, quote, a must read for anyone who wants to learn more about originalism, while another said that, quote, the historical narrative pulls you in while enjoyably explaining the topic. It is four and a half stars on Amazon.com, and it is indeed a brilliant book. And if that book leaves you looking for a little bit more, Elon published a second book late last year titled The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment. It currently enjoys a perfect five-star Amazon rating, with one scholar calling it, quote, the clearest, most straightforward book explaining our Constitution's promises of equal citizenship, the rule of law, and protection from violence. As much as Mr. Madison said that we owe a debt to the framers of our Constitution, we also owe a debt of gratitude to Elon for both of these works. In addition to his scholarship, Elon has also worked as counsel to the presidential campaign of Rand Paul and the Senate campaign of Tom Cotton. Most recently, and most pertinent to tonight's event, Elon represented a group of bar owners in a suit challenging occupancy restrictions put in place by Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Those restrictions, conveniently enough, were lifted just before Elon was set to present his case before the Arizona Supreme Court. This will be a rich discussion because it blends the academic and pragmatic. And as many scholars have observed over many decades, these issues transcend party lines. On behalf of the New Jersey chapter of the Federal Society, thank you both for joining us tonight. Matt, let's start with you. You were at ground zero from day one of COVID. And while the use of executive powers is something most New Jerseyans are familiar with, 
they're ordinarily invoked in anticipation of upcoming snowstorms, not global pandemics. Perhaps walk us through for a few minutes what it was like on the ground and the myriad of legal considerations and processes that you and your team went through when developing a response to the pandemic. Thanks, Ryan. Um, you know, appreciate you having me. Uh, um, I don't get many invitations to join the Federal Society for an event, but I, I really do uh, enjoy these conversations. And you forgot to mention that uh, I work with you at Longside, so it's great to, to see you in a, a different setting. Um, and Alon, obviously, it's been a while. I was one year behind Alon, so I have a year to catch up with his uh, book prowess, um, which I will not. Um, but uh, we did... Uh, I did run the ACS when he was running FedSoc, and generally, actually, I thought they were they, there was a lot of good collaboration between the two groups and spirited, but but fun and healthy debate. Um, so, yeah, I served as chief counsel, um, uh, as Ryan said, um, for the first uh, seven eight months of the pandemic, which was I think when the bulk of the real legal challenges were being. Um, Considered in the early days, I think it's important, you know, in any of these conversations, and, and frankly, if you read the briefs in most of the cases, the states are all making relatively similar arguments, um, and a lot of them are grounded in the facts uh, of that time. Um, but the early days of the pandemic in New Jersey was really, in the United States at least, at the forefront of the pandemic, given how hard we were hit in March and uh, early to mid March of uh, 2020. Um, you know, March 4th was the first date of our first case. It was also in New Jersey, the date the governor was having cancer surgery. Um, so, uh, you know, to remove a cancerous lesion from his tumor, not that that was at any impact on our decisions, but it just added another level of challenge in, in advising him of his options. Um, and, and I think about that, you know, we had the anniversary of one year of March 4th, just a few weeks ago, and, and the pace at which things were changing in those early days was, I think unprecedented in modern history. We went from thinking there's no way, you know, we'd be closing schools or you know restaurants to closing those types of activities, not just for a couple of weeks as we originally thought, but for for months. Um, issuing stay-at-home orders, um, dramatically curtailing human interaction um, in ways that was really never foreseeable or contemplated. I think prior uh, to this pandemic. Um, but we learned, you know, as, as we were going through and living through tremendous amount of, of spread of the virus, tragically a significant amount of death, we learned more about the virus and that did impact, you know, the decisions we were making. Um, but March 4th's first case, March 9th, we declared under New Jersey law, and we can get into the, the nuances, but there's two statutes that are relevant here. Um, the state, state of emergency is declared under the Disaster Control Act. The state of emergency, once declared, exists under New Jersey law until either it is revoked or the conditions that underpin and establish the emergency no longer exist. When we declared the state of emergency on March 9th, there were 11 positive cases in New Jersey. They were actually called presumed positive at the time. You may remember cases needed to be sent to, you had a test. It was actually every test was sent to the CDC in Atlanta. For confirmation, obviously that became completely impractical very quickly, but that's how the cases were confirmed. So we had 11 presumed positive cases when we declared state of emergency. At the same time, we declared a public health emergency under a separate statute, the Emergency Health Powers Act, both of which had been in existence for uh, for decades. The Emergency Health Powers Act for about 15-ish years, and the, Pup the Disaster Control Act for several decades, um, and. Uh, on March 16th was the first day that we issued what you could, I guess you could call a shutdown order. It was sort of the first of two major orders. Uh, it was the order that closed schools, um, that uh, limited, began to limit gatherings, um, that closed certain entertainment businesses, limited restaurants to dine or to take out only, um, and restricted retail hours. And just to give you a context of how we were making these decisions, they were based in all of those activities were based on the best public health guidance we had at the time. I'll be candid that the public health guidance from Washington was pretty minimal. In fact, it was contradicting the public health guidance that we were receiving from, from almost everywhere else. Um, but there were unknowns and there were tremendous unknowns. And I think courts have appropriately 
been deferential to executives given the extent of the unknowns, particularly in those early days. Um, and I'll never forget, we signed, the governor signed that order on March 16th, that first order in the state, in, in the governor's office, you get an embargoed copy of the labor statistics or a certain number of people do every Thursday morning, it tells you how many jobs you've gained or lost. Usually these reports are entirely uninteresting. Um, it, those weeks, I'll never forget the first one we got the week after we signed that order. We lost 160,000 jobs in New Jersey. It was by far to that point the worst uh, week in terms of unemployment in the history of the state. We set, we subsequently topped it in several weeks uh, to come. Um, so I was sitting there. We knew that we lost those jobs. We knew that the jobs mapped perfectly almost to the order that the governor had signed. Um, we didn't know if this was going to cost the governor's reelection, and it wasn't even in, in thought. But you didn't know how the public was going to react, whether they were going to comply with these orders. Um, all we had to go on was the public health guidance. Um, and I remember thinking, we better be right um, because we really did trust the the guidance that we received from public health officials. And you know, when we signed that order, and then he signed a more draconian shutdown order. Um, we were uh, rapidly facing the worst pandemic in U.S. history in the region, and you know we ended up losing more people than the state lost in 9/11 just in that first month and a half. Um, but ultimately, the actions that the governor took, I think, were widely credited with closing, slowing the spread of the virus, um, and bringing us back into some measurable and controllable level. Um, and slowly but surely, he gradually re uh, relaxed restrictions. And I just say that because. We can get into you know how these cases have been argued. Um, you mentioned Ryan that we signed over 100 orders in my or 80 orders in my time. It's well over 100 uh, now. Uh, you know we really were careful. Um, we were careful to ensure that we were operating within the bounds of of state law and the law and the authority that was delegated to the governor, which in New Jersey is broad. Um, we were very careful to ensure that we weren't infringing in a way that was uh, you know that was not defensible unconstitutional rights. Um, and if you look at our orders, we were careful to protect those rights, which is why I think in large part, New Jersey, unlike many states, uh, Governor Murphy, not one of his orders has been struck down, um, despite dozens of challenges that we defended. Um, you know, we tailored in every order, we tailored the actions that the governor took directly to responding to the public health crisis and mitigating the spread of COVID-19. And we took a lot of effort I would say in our orders, I would stack them up against you know, most other states. Our recitals are very long to show how, how thoughtful we tried to be in thinking uh, through the steps that the governor was taking and ensuring that there was a clear nexus and a relationship both under state because of state law reasons as well as federal law reasons um, for why uh, what we were doing was defensible. And then as information flowed and we learned more about the virus, remember, in March, I actually got COVID on April 6th. I think about this a lot because on April 6th, when I was diagnosed, I got it at the workplace. We weren't masking. The guidance from CDC was actually not to mask for a period of time, because if you remember, you were touching your face. The idea was you were touching your face and spreading it. As a result of that, we didn't know how it impacted sir. We still don't have full understanding of how the virus spreads on, on, on frequently touched surfaces or high contact surfaces. Um, so there was a lot we didn't know as we got to, as the virus got to a more manageable level and we learned more, we re, um, you know, we reconsidered a lot of the orders that we had in place. And I think that what you've seen since then uh, has been a more nuanced approach, uh, again, based on public health guidance at every step. Um, I could obviously go on. I will say just personally, this uh, dealing with these challenges were, was the single hardest thing I, I will probably ever do in my career. Um, the balancing of obviously understanding where the legal lines were, balancing public health guidance, thinking at all times of what was actually enforceable um, because you didn't want to run into a situation where you had widespread non-compliance um, as well as what would the public tolerate. Um, and then, you know, obviously what, what will be the best way to slow the spread is, are, are not easy. I, I don't pretend that we were perfect. I think we were, were perfect in the sense that we haven't lost a case, but I, I don't think it was anybody who sits here and say there aren't things you can learn from this. Um, I don't think our laws are perfectly written for a pandemic. As Ryan said, our state laws are, are really geared towards a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. Um, a pandemic is sort of an unprecedented emergency. 
Um, and I, I, I actually think more of these types of conversations as we emerge from it, but before we get too far from it, that we lose the fresh perspective are important to assess, well, okay, well, how do the tools work? Where are the constitutional lines? And how do we think about, God forbid, if this type of emergency uh, comes back in the future? So I'll stop there. That's a quick overview of, of what we experience and how we approach these issues. Yeah, and Matt, um, uh, you know, as I'm sure you and you and your team uh, saw, and I know, you know, when I worked for Governor Christie and, and we were looking at uh, what the state's response would be to the Ebola threat at the time, which, you know, we were very, very concerned about. Um, what we discovered is is the relevant health walls that, um, that either the governor or the commissioner of health uh, can assume emergency power under uh, actually go back to the the Spanish flu, uh, and and some of them were haven't been amended since since about that time too, uh, subject to you know the recodifications that have occurred. Um, you know, so to your point that that some of these walls were, were either weren't built for this or were you know are, are on the books but relatively antiquated. Um, you know, we're we're scrambling to try to find as much as we could about the enactment of some of these walls that were almost a hundred years old. Yeah, I think, and I'll, I'll stop it for this. It, that's a good point. You know, one of the Executive Order 103, which was the March 4th state of emergency, public health emergency. When you declare a public health emergency, the commissioner of health is in charge for obvious reasons. When you declare a state of emergency, the governor delegates authority to the head of emergency management under New Jersey law, which is the colonel and superintendent of state police. When you declare both, there's a very legitimate question of who's in charge. Um, so if you go and you look at Executive Order 103, we wrote it so that essentially both were in charge. And the reason for that was because you had a very clear public health emergency. And first and foremost, it was a public health emergency, uh, but you also had a very real logistical, traditional emergency management challenge that you needed the flexibility under the Disaster Control Act to move equipment. Remember, we were building hospitals. We were moving millions of pieces of PPE. We were obviously you know, preparing hopefully one day to get things like a vaccine. All of that, and now that those powers are now being used for those purposes, ventilators, everything back in that time was really more of a logistical challenge that was stemming from the public health emergency. Um, so you needed both, and there was it, it never happened before. So you know we put both in charge, and it worked out you know fine. But uh, it was one of those questions when you're looking at two separate statutes that put two different people in charge, and you say, okay, well, like what do we do now? Um, the answer was in that moment, you know, and you had three, four hours to figure that out at maybe one or two in the a.m. in the morning. Um, you went with both, um, and that's that's how that happened. Uh, Elon, I want to bring you in now because you're, you know, coming from a completely different perspective than than Matt here is on this, right? So you, you know, and 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 give us a little bit of background, but you represented. Uh, in in Arizona, you've represented uh, a group of um, a group of bar owners or bar and restaurant owners. Um, you know, as Matt talked about the you know kind of the, the plunge in, in in unemployment that we faced is you know as a result of some of the measures that that were put in place early on. Um, you know, and and you know I think everyone has conceded that you know what was hit the hardest or one of the hardest right away was you know was bars and restaurants. Um, so maybe take us through, you know, kind of your experience on, on that representation. Yeah, happy to. And so obviously um, the statutory authorities and the trajectory of the government response sort of differs from state to state. So just briefly, uh, I think in March 19 was the first order, the emergency declaration here in Arizona, where sort of everybody was shut down. Uh, restaurants, bars, doesn't matter. It was kind of like a stay-at-home order, except for essential workers. This was then lifted. Um, uh, it was extended briefly at the end of April. The governor got a lot of blowback for this. I mean, it is, it's a purplish state, right? I mean, it's leans, leans red. And then he opened up a, a two weeks later in mid-May only to see the summer cases increase. And so then at the end of July, he issued a new order, which was the principal order that we were challenging in our lawsuit that basically shut down gyms, bars, water parks, and movie theaters. And the, so, so they were shut down for about two months. And then in, on August 10, our Department of Health, pursuant to that executive order, published guidelines pursuant to which bars and gyms would be able to open and on what conditions they would be able to open. So starting in September, 
maybe very late August, uh, uh, some bars were able to open if, you know, they served food um, and at very limited capacity and with all of these other uh, uh, other restrictions. And so uh, I got involved in the case when I was uh, hanging out on the legendary Whiskey Row in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, <laughs> Second order at the end of June comes, and uh, the uh, the bar owners were describing. You know, I, we were a friend of ours who's actually running for Congress was uh, who lives in Prescott was telling us it was such a gut punch uh, to the bar owners, and then the bar owners came out and chatted. And my friend was like, "Well, he's a he's a lawyer and he's a constitutional law professor, so I couldn't use my <laughs> usual excuse, which is I'm not that kind of lawyer." Uh, and so that's how uh, I got involved in the case. And the first thing that we have to determine is, are we suing in federal court or are we suing in state court? And I told the bars, I told the bars, every single lawsuit that has been filed in federal court is going to lose. Every single one. Why? Because you either have a federal equal protection claim, which is a loser, uh, rational basis, which I hope we'll talk about today, uh, or it's going to be substantive due process, which is also a loser. First of all, it's a made up <laughs> Certainly, if you care about economic liberties, it's 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 a loser. So I said we're going to file in state court under state constitutional law claim. We're going to raise two arguments. We're going to make a non-delegation claim. Uh, basically, who should be in charge of these kinds of policy decisions in this kind of emergency? Uh, the state legislature or the governor, right? So can the governor can the state legislature delegate its legislative power on an ongoing basis and under under what conditions? So so here in our state, the the statute gives the governor all police power in the event of an emergency, including a pandemic. Now, what does this all police power means? Well, it, it depends. Uh, if it means what our governor thinks it means, uh, then I think it violates the non-delegation doctrine. And, and I hope to get into that later. And then we made a claim under the state privileges or immunities clause, which is kind of like the federal equal protection clause. And actually, if you read my new book, Second Founding, my whole argument is that the federal privileges or immunities clause is was supposed to do this work. To you know, it's a state law that says, uh, it's a state constitutional provision that says no law shall be enacted granting to any citizen, class of citizen or corporation, privileges or duties, which on the same terms shall not belong to all citizens or corporations. So basically it's an equality provision. And our claim was, wait a minute, you're shutting down bars, but restaurants have bars and they're open. Hotels have bars and they're open. Clubs have bars and they're open. And at trial, we had a preliminary injunction hearing. We showed video of a restaurant with a restaurant license that turned into a nightclub on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. And so very, you know, naturally, this makes people feel kind of upset. It seems very arbitrary. Uh, and so those are the claims, uh, the two principal claims uh, that that we brought. Uh, and um, we were supposed to have our case heard uh, in the Supreme Court uh, a few days, just five days, four days before argument. The governor issues a new executive order that uh, surprise, surprise, just before uh, the Supreme Court is bound to hear it. Uh, so we never uh, had uh, um, a hearing in the Supreme Court, at least on our preliminary injunction. But but time permitting, I would like to talk about, you know, both the non-delegation argument that we make and, and you know, who, who in this kind of situation should be making these policy decisions? You know, with all due respect to my friend and colleague, you know, Matt, like, I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure they believed they were doing the right thing. But that's not the question, right? The question is when people disagree about what the right thing might be, when 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 public policy experts disagree, when the people disagree over important and controversial policy questions, the question is not, you know, uh, well, if the governor thinks this is the right thing, should should he do it? Of course, the governor, I would hope, never does something they think is the wrong thing. The question is, what do we do in event of disagreement? Who should make those kinds of decisions? And I think the state legislature. Uh, was available and able to make those kinds of decisions in the coronavirus uh, during the during the pandemic. And uh, I have more I can say about that. As for the discrimination claim, uh, even if we assume the governor is the right person for it, lots of courts gave what's called rational basis deference to the governor. I'm not at all clear why a governor deserves rational basis deference. A state legislature might, but I'm not sure why a governor deserves that deference. And so that's also an argument we raised that the rational basis test uh, does not apply. On, on, on both arguments, uh, we relied on some scholarship that I've published um, on this issue, but that's a that's a eagle eye version. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's dive in a little bit. Um, you know, you, you raised the, the, the non-delegation clause, right? And I feel like, you know, for me at least, um, that's like the bill of attainder. Like I, you know, remember that there's, you know, there's this, there's this 
uh, doctrine in law in which that says, you know, that the legislature can't hand over powers um, that, you know, that it itself um, uh, uh, has um, and, and, and only uh, the legislature has. Um, but, you know, in your best impression of a constitutional law scholar, you know, perhaps like walk us through a little bit what that meant. Um, and I feel like there's almost a little bit of a standing issue there, too, that maybe you can talk about, um, you know, if, 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 you're, if, if you're representing in front of the courts, that the legislature is not, um, you know, is, is, has misdelegated its authority. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you had to, to talk about that as well. Yeah, so, so, I mean, there's certainly no standing issue, right? If the legislature unconstitutionally delegates legislative power and it affects a private right and, and you're affected thereby, you can certainly sue uh, if the legislature, sure you know, right? Now, now, the governor, no problem, defended the legislature's law. I suppose if the governor chose not to, to defend or the president chooses not to defend DOMA, maybe Congress has standing, right? And so that's a congressional standing type question. Um, but certainly if our private rights are affected, there's no problem. But but look, what does the non-delegation doctrine say? It's separation of powers 101. This crowd doesn't 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 need reminding of this, right? But the legislature makes the law, the executive executes the law, and the court adjudicates disputes under existing law. Now, does that mean there's no overlap in power? Of course not. Of course there's overlapping power. A lot of things the executive does making regulations, rulemakings. They look legislative and they can be considered legislative. Or and, and, and so there's certainly overlapping power, what I call in my scholarship and in my new case book on administrative law that's coming out in May, uh, I call it non exclusive power. Basically, you know, uh, uh, Congress uh, can delegate to the executive power that it can exercise itself as well, right? So George Washington, under the first statute, one of the earliest statutes in 1789, the the Congress uh, the the new Congress uh, assumed uh, uh, the 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 pension payments to the invalid veterans of the Revolutionary War under such regulations as the President of the United States may direct. Okay, what did President Washington say? Okay, we'll make it in two equal installments. Come three months apart. Here are the proofs and affidavits. Was this regulation? You know, could Congress have done it? Of course, of course, Congress could have done it. But did Congress uh, have to do it? No. It's the kind of thing that we wouldn't expect that Congress would have to do. It's sufficiently unimportant, it's sufficiently administrative, it's sufficiently detail-oriented that Congress could delegate that power uh, to the president. So this is what I call non-exclusive legislative power. Congress could exercise it itself, but we could also give it to the executive. And when the executive does it, it's simply executing law. Having said that, Chief Justice Marshall, in a case from 1825, recognized this point. He said, surely Congress can delegate to others what it could also do itself. But he said there is nevertheless a category of what he called exclusively legislative power that only Congress can exercise. And that's the non-delegation doctrine. What is this exclusively legislative power that Congress or the legislature has to be the one to decide? Well, in classic Marshallian terms, he said the line has not been exactly drawn, right? Uh, <laughs> he said Congress has to resolve the important subjects, right? That is subjects that are sufficiently important that we would expect the people's representatives to deliberate and debate and decide upon it rather than giving it to the executive. Now, what? Are, so that's the million dollar question. The trillion dollar question, because a million dollars isn't a lot of money these days for, for government anyway. The trillion dollar question is, what are the important subjects? What are the important subjects that are within this exclusively legislative power that a state legislature has to exercise? A lot of formalists, originalists say any regulation of private rights, private conduct is legislative. I don't think that's right. Okay, in 1852, Congress authorized the Steamboat Inspection Service uh, to impose passenger limits on ships. That affects private rights and conducts. They authorized the making of rules for when ships pass. Like that affects private rights. That can't be it. And so what I was gonna argue to the Supreme Court, what I did argue to the Supreme Court, though I didn't get to orally argue it, uh, was um, there are really three factors that, that, that matter here. One is the nature of the delegation. Look, is this merely official conduct? And, 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 by, and by the way, that's how I think most emergencies, what most emergencies have to do with. A fire, flood, Earthquake, hurricane, you know, the governor directs emergency services, direct uh, uh, official personnel. You can build shelters, rescue operations, right? But affecting private citizen, okay, you have to close your business. Okay, you can only have 50% of your capacity at any time, right? That affects private citizens. That's a, that's a different in kind, right, this delegation. So uh, the nature of the power matters. Does it affect private citizens or just officials? Uh, 
Does it affect your private rights or what's called public rights, like welfare benefits? That's a historic distinction, which we could get into. But another important factor is the scope of the, the subject matter, right? Is it a narrow issue? Uh, for example, Panama refining. Uh, does Can the president, the president gets to decide whether to, to, to ban the interstate shipment of hot oil. That's one little narrow issue. Okay. Schechter poultry, the president gets to make codes of fair competition for the entire economy. Okay. So the scope of the subject matter surely matters too, as well as the breadth of the discretion, which is sort of the, the principle now, the intelligible principle of doctrine. So look, we argued the more the delegation affects private rights and private conduct, the, the, the narrower the scope of the subject matter. Okay. You can't, you can maybe mandate vaccines under certain conditions, but you can't give the governor power to do whatever he thinks necessary and affect human conduct across, you know, under uh, you know, anything under the sun. Uh, so the narrower the scope has to be, and the more specific the discretion has to be. And what we argued is a delegation of all police power to a governor doesn't meet that standard. Uh, in other words, if a delegation of all police power to the governor uh, to make ongoing, important, controversial policy decisions, touching everything under the sun, from schools uh, to healthcare to bars and restaurants to whether people can leave their homes or not to curfews, um, if that doesn't violate the non-delegation doctrine, when the legislature is able to meet, is able to meet and deliberate on these issues, if that doesn't violate the non-delegation doctrine, then we don't know what does. And so that was the non-delegation argument that we made in a nutshell. You know, Matt, um, you know, again, from from more the kind of the, the, the pragmatic um, aspect and, and what you're faced with, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're looking at, um, you know, you're, you're looking at the walls that, that, that Congress has provided and are on the books. You're looking at the precedent uh, that is set by, uh, you know, governors and, and presidents, which seemingly is, you know, moving the ball forward, uh, you know, from each administration with kind of assuming more and more powers. Um, and then you're hit with, uh, you know, something like a global pandemic where, you know, to, Elon, to Elon's point about, you know, if the legislature is capable of meeting, um, I, you know, at, at, at one point it seemed like no one was capable of doing anything but going outside their, their homes or at least fearful about doing uh, much outside their, outside their homes. Um, and so, you know, and, and you have a limited time to act as well. Um, you know, so, um, you, you know, just curious if, if you recall, if anyone had, had tried to make similar challenges under New Jersey's constitution, which you, um, you know, which you mentioned is, uh, you know, provides the executive with vast powers, more than, you know, many states, um, you know, as, as well as the, um, the public health law and the disaster control act that, that you had said earlier. Um, no, and it wouldn't work here. I mean, there's no there's no case law to support a non delegation argument in New Jersey uh, comparable to the federal one. And you know, I have to say, I'm a little surprised to hear a Federalist Society argument that congressional Supreme Court non delegation doctrine should apply universally to all states, regardless of the uniqueness of their constitutional structures. We have a line item veto in New Jersey that's not allowed under federal law. Uh, that's a quasi legislative act that the executive is constitutionally entitled to do. And so, no, that argument, I mean, no, I have tremendous respect for Elon. It would not have worked here. It was never made in the dozens of lawsuits that we saw, um, as far as I know. Um, and maybe it has been since, but I, I don't recall seeing it. Um, and it would not have worked under existing case law. Um, and it, going back to, you know, the core question, though, is was the legislature involved? They were very involved. There is good reason why the legislature would take a decision in non-pandemic times, by the way, to delegate certain authorities to the governor in a state where the governor has already brought authorities um, in normal times to act. And that's because when a pandemic hits or a terrorist attack hits or a storm hits, you need to move quickly. And the governor as a democratically elected official is the person who is best positioned for statewide decisions uh, to make statewide decisions in the context uh, of an emergency and to make them quickly and to make them based on the best guidance he gets and to implement them in a way that protects the health, safety, and welfare of, of in New Jersey's case, 9 million residents. Despite that, there's regular interaction. We have a full-time legislature in New Jersey, and, and has, in recent years, they've been active 
12 months a year. In the pandemic, we actually passed a law, the governor signed a law that allowed for uh, virtual hearings and virtual voting. Never happened in the history of the state. Uh, so there was no restriction on them being able to meet and pass laws to change anything about the governor's authority. We routinely briefed them. In many instances, we codified executive order. We worked with them on an executive order. The executive order is the quickest procedural way to implement something. There was buy-in on the front end, and then they codified our orders in statute. Um, sometimes that was to, in order to strengthen it in case we were challenged, but most times it was because they agreed with what we were doing and they wanted to do it. Um, and so there was a healthy amount of interaction there, regular briefings, but the need to move quickly. I mean, I can't underscore, and this is, I can't underscore how challenging and fast paced the environment we were. I mean, sometimes it was hours. There was a period of time where we were using the power to commandeer uh, equipment under both the Disaster Control Act and the Emergency Health Powers Act, authority that was delegated to the government. We were using that power through orders. We never actually had to go ahead and commandeer, but we used the threat of it to get access to facilities that we needed in order to, pro to provide a public health response. I don't know how that would have worked if, by the way, there's legal recourse there if somebody wanted to challenge that, no one did. Like, I don't know how that would work if I had to submit a bill to the legislature. They had to go through a committee process. They had to lay on the desk or they had to get an emergency vote. What would have happened is our hospitals would have overflowed and people would have died. And that's why the legislature made the decision to delegate the authority to the executive. It's not an indefinite delegation of authority. This is obviously an ex extraordinary circumstance. But it is, in my opinion, a necessary delegation of authority. Um, and the way our constitutional structure works, at least in New Jersey, there's nothing inappropriate or unlawful about that. And if at any point in time the legislature decided to change that delegation, they could have, from the comfort of their living room, changed it. And they chose not to. And I, I think there's a reason why, and not to conflate the two questions you raised a lot, that going back to um, going back to Jacobson versus Massachusetts over a hundred years ago, the Supreme Court and basically every court, you know, with few exceptions in the COVID pandemic, has been has applied a similarly relaxed standard when evaluating the governor's decisions because the governor is the democratically elected official who is best positioned to make these decisions. I would argue that an unelected judge as much deference as I have to the judiciary, is not an appropriate person who de to make decisions about what is the best and most appropriate public health response, particularly in a context where uncertainty is greatest. That's why I get going back to where I started, the scope of the orders that the governor issued in New Jersey and pretty much elsewhere, and you mentioned in Arizona, same thing. The earlier parts of the pan days of the pandemic, those orders were far broader. We had a stay at home order in effect in New Jersey for, for the early parts of the pandemic also. As we learned more about what was truly causing spread and what wasn't, we revised those orders and more narrowly tailored the action. And that's exactly what the legislature authorized the governor to do. We, I would say the state of Arizona made a mistake by creating those sort of arbitrary line drawing where you have restaurants that can have bars but not bars. We went out of our way to not have those, and we were very, very careful. So when we opened casinos on July 4th, we also you know, opened in Nordai, um, to with similar capacities. We always gave greater deference to the right to worship than we did to other non-protected rights. We were very, very careful. Um, and you have to be, and you should be, because these are extraordinarily important decisions. But I don't think that just because we took those actions suggests that the legis and, and the, le the legislature unlawfully delegated the authority to the governor. I, I don't think that the, that argument necessarily flows from the other. Can I jump no, in? What, and what do you think? Oh, good. Yeah, no, I I I, I want to I want to bring it back. I mean, what do you think about this idea of um, you know again this is this is again kind of a little bit of a transition um, from the pragmatic to the to the academic and back again, but but this idea of the legislature 
you know, essentially either abrogating its responsibilities or choosing not to exercise them, um, you know, uh, in, in a way that um, is either, um, you know, comfortable with, with the governor's direction um, or, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, is, is, is divided enough that they can't assume, you know, majorities to overturn those decisions. So what role you know, should the legislature have in this, you know, to Matt's point of, um, you know, that, that from an executive perspective, they have to act and they have to act fast. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, so there are a couple of things there in what you both ha have just said. The first thing I'll say is, you know, the fact that the legislature wants to delegate power and is happy with governors exercising power, that doesn't answer the constitutional question of whose power it is to exercise and whose duty it is to exercise. Uh, the legislature wants to delegate power. This is public choice theory, right? Public choice theory says uh, government officials, bureaucrats act with the same motives that private individuals in a private market, uh, that is in their self-interest. And from John Hart Ely in 1980 uh, to today, people recognize that it's within the legislature's uh, interest to delegate power. Why? Because then they can get credit for doing all these nice, feel goody things like passing a statute that says we shall have clean air or we shall stop emergencies. And then when it comes to making the tough choices that actually hurt people, they can go back to their constituents and on the back end say, oh, well, we didn't mean for that to happen, or I don't agree with the governor's choice in that respect. And then you get brownie points for doing the good thing on the front end and brownie points on the back end for disagree with the hard choices uh, that the governor has to make. So of course the legislature want, doesn't want to make tough policy choices. They want to pass the buck. This is this is public choice theory. And I don't think it answers the question of, of whose constitutional power and duty it is. And you know, to Matt's point, you know, could the legislature have done something if it maybe, but I don't know how, again how New Jersey's constitution works, but uh, I think they would have needed Governor Murphy's signature. And if Governor Murphy had vetoed something, a mere one third of either house of the legislature in most states uh, is can uphold that veto. And so this is a classic point that John Randolph actually made in 1803 when they were about to delegate total power to Thomas Jefferson over the Louisiana territory. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute to govern the Louisiana territory. He said, once we give this power out of our hands, it'll be imp impossible to reclaim it because one third of either house can prevent its resumption because it'll, it'll take a presidential veto supported by one third of either house. So I think it's very, very difficult uh, for the legislature to step in. And so the fact that it doesn't want to and that it has the theoretical ability to step in, uh, I think just don't, just don't answer the constitutional uh, question. And look, Matt's point is fair. I don't want to be misconstrued here. I don't mean to say that every action these govern governors have taken would violate the non-delegation doctrine, right? We have specific statutes that say you can mandate vaccines. Uh, in a public health crisis. We don't, okay, fine, that's a specific delegation with, with uh, reasonably precise or relatively precise standards given the context. The power to commandeer specifically given, again, re relatively precise uh, 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 in, the, in the context. But again, under at least our delegation of all police powers, you know, uh, it, does everything have to be done quickly? The decision to, to open and close schools. Why can't the legislature deliberate on that? Why can't the legislature deliberate and say, okay, we believe that this is the threat and uh, it's more important that schools be closed until X, Y, or Z metric is met? Or why can't they pass a, a law that says, well, we don't think coronavirus is a threat and therefore we want uh, to, to children, the, the data is, is, is out there and we want them to open. Uh, you know, why can't the legislature meet to discuss whether bars should still be closed when they've been closed for eight months? Why is that the kind of thing that a governor has to has to act. So, so I agree with Matt that there are certain kinds of things that only a governor can do. You know, uh, if there's a fire or a flood, the immediate search and rescue operations. I mean, those are literally things the legislatures can't do. Okay. And maybe there were some things here about the initial shutdown orders that they could have done because we didn't know we lived with uncertainty and pending crisis. I get it. But months later, why can't the legislature meet and make a lot of these choices involving schools and dine-in and, and casinos and capacity restrictions? Why can't it? Nothing's preventing it uh, uh, from doing it. So, I would, I would, I would push back on that. Uh, Jacobson's, uh, Jacobson's a whole other can of worms. Uh, I think Jacobson is. It's actually a nice segue to the rational basis point. Jacobson was just a substantive due process case. It, do you have a substantive due process right to resist compulsory vaccination? I mean, not even compulsory vaccination. You would just get fined if you refuse to take the vaccination. I agree with Jacobson. There's no substance because I don't believe in substantive due process. 
right? I, I don't think you have a right to be free of vaccination if the state legislature thinks it's good, you know, in the public interest for everyone to get vaccinated. I don't think there's a substantive due process, right, for that. There's no written constitutional right that would protect you. It's not a search, hate to break it to you, you know, or a seizure, especially if you can get out of it with a fine. So that's a substantive due process. How then that is translated into this immense deference in times of pandemic under all statu- constitutional provisions, I have no idea how that happened. Like that is something someone should research and investigate. Um, so, so why don't we transition to the the um, the the standard of review here, right? You know, and Matt talked about that that you know he and he used kind of the the the, the famous buzzwords there that you know the governor acted in a way to protect uh, the health, safety, and welfare of you know the citizens of the state, um, and you know, and in, in uh, a way in which, you know, that they have a legitimate government interest in, in doing. And, you know, Elon, the, your, the beginning of your remarks, you talked about, um, you know, the deference that's owed to uh, the executive branch uh, when they are, um, or I'm sorry, the legislative branch when they, uh, you know, when they pass a law. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is this a little bit less defined of the idea when the executive branch is acting in the way they do uh, under emergency powers. And, you know, what kind of scrutiny should courts be applying to that? Yeah, so I, I does it matter. And does it matter what the what the emergency is? I guess yeah, the next question. Yeah, so I'll keep this part very brief, you know, because I said a lot earlier that I also want, you know, to give Matt a chance to respond to. What I say is, you know, the rational basis test. So I've done historical scholarship on on the origins of police powers and substantive due process doctrine. And when you look in a way at the antebellum cases, there was something like a rational basis test when it came to legislatures, right? In theory, they were limited to reasonable exercises of the police power. But what was reasonable exercise of the police power was within the legislative wisdom, right? So cases say this, Cooley says this in his treatise and so on. But it was different when the legislature delegated power, not necessarily to governors, but to municipal corporations. When uh, this legislature delegated police powers, local legislative power to municipal corporations, courts did review them for reasonableness. If the legislature specifically authorized something unreasonable to be done, the courts couldn't do anything about it. But under a broader delegation of authority to regulate in the public interest or public safety or public health, the, the, the theory was that the legislature couldn't have intended to delegate the power to do unreasonable things, uh, unlike the legislature, which you know has to deliberate uh, among multiple people, checked and balanced by the executive. Uh, ordinarily, a city council, selectmen, aldermen, you know, don't aren't checked and balanced by anybody. Um, uh, there's uh, and, and so the the theory was we the courts police them uh, uh, and make sure that they're acting reasonably. And in my view, I mean, no one's ever really uh, fleshed this out and and cases assume rational basis applies no matter if it's the executive or the legislature, but why? But why? If the legislature has delegated broad powers to the executive, it seems to me the executive is more in the position of a municipal corporation. The governor is exercising delegated power, broad power, doesn't have to deliberate with anybody, isn't checked and balanced by anybody. Uh, And so why should one man or woman acting alone, get immense deference, right? It might make sense for the legislature, but once it delegates power in broad terms, uh, it doesn't make sense to me that the rational basis deference uh, uh, would apply. Anyway, there's another element to the argument. Um, I'm not sure it applies to privileges or immunities claims either, uh, but uh, you know that's getting more, more in the weeds and I think is less interesting for our purposes. So, so I, I agree with you. I, I would echo the same thing back. Why should one man or woman on their own get to decide what the right policy is. The governor doesn't do that. The governor acts in accordance with statutory authority that has been delegated to him by the legislature. He has to base his decisions based on public health guidance from a team of people. How can he disregard it? Sure. He is then subject to, in New Jersey, an election every four years, unlike a judge uh, who is not, and is subject to the political whims that, I mean, I talked about in the beginning. It's not an abstract, concern. I mean, politics were certainly the furthest things from your mind, but no politician wants to do something that 9 million people are going to revolt if he does it and might not solve the public health problem. It's just a judge doesn't have that consideration. They are totally and by design and appropriately immune from the concerns of the public. And so I would argue that the greatest risk would be a judge applying his or her own policy. Now, if there is 
an infringement on a fundamental right. I think this all flows from Jacobson. And by the way, this isn't my formulation. Chief Justice Roberts basically adopted it. So, you know, I assume there's some Chief Justice, Rob, Justice Roberts fans still in this audience. Um, he got it wrong. He got it wrong too. But yes, okay. yeah, South Bay Pentecostal. I mean, I'm, I'm almost quoting him. You know, if if there's a fundamental right involved, which is why I think. Anybody who was thinking these through, if they weren't paying particular houses of worship, were I, I think the particularly most challenging issue here. Um, because, and I'll take a quick aside there. The reason why houses of worship were so challenging, not just because there was a fundamental right at issue, though there there was, in terms of the the, the you know you didn't want to violate the the right um, to worship, but in this pandemic, the things that most uh, directly spread the virus were the things that people were often doing in houses of worship, singing, congregating in close quarters, standing next to each other for extended periods of time. So when the question was raised in the free exercise cases about how can you have a different, and it wasn't true in our case, but it was in, in California, how can you have a different, or New York, a different state, uh, set threshold for how many people can be in a building in a retail establishment than you do in a house of worship. There actually are arguments why that would make sense from a public health perspective. But that's where we would step in, I think, as lawyers and say, listen, there may be public health arguments here. Those are really tough arguments to make to a judge. And appropriately, I think people who took those co concerns seriously avoided the type of scrutiny that um, you know, some places ran, ran into trouble with. Um, so, yeah. I, I think, and I go back to where I started, the governor as a democratically elected person is, with delegated authority from the, from the legislature, still subject to judicial review. And that review in New Jersey, at least, it's very similar under Worthington v. Farver. There haven't been a ton of cases, but the standard is basically if you're rad, rationally related to a legitimate government interest. So it boils down to some form of a rational basis review, as have the federal courts. I think that's the appropriate standard. Um, if you can't make an argument as to how the action that you are taking is related in some way to minimizing the spread of, a, in this case, a pandemic or responding to the emergency, then yeah, your action should be struck down and you shouldn't be taking that action. Similarly, if you are affecting a fundamental right or a profound constitutional right, yeah, there should be a heightened standard for that. And I think there has been. I think that's the way the courts have viewed this, which is why the houses of worship cases, I think, have been the most contentious and most scrutinized in all of, or, you know, first or second amendment cases or things like that, that, you know, really were challenging. But deciding whether there should be a mask mandate, deciding whether restaurants should be at 25% or 50% of fire code, I'm not sure that that is where a judge with no public health apparatus to advise him or her is well positioned to decide. Is you know, and I know we're we're running out of time, guys. Um, you know, and I appreciate. I feel like this is <laughs> we could we could you know go back to Whiskey Row and uh, and, mm -hmm. and throw down a couple of drinks and, and this conversation go on all night. But you know, what in in is is it a moving target? Is the standard of review in, in some ways a bit of a, a, of a moving target? We're talking about the use of executive powers. And, and what I mean by that is, right, so we, you know, the legislature passes a law and, um, and, and under, you know, rational basis, what I'm saying, and, and a judge or, or a court and an appellate court um, decides that the law is constitutional, right? So everyone then says, okay, the law is constitutional. In, uh, in in a world of which executive powers, right? You you know is can that can that um, standard review what whatever it is like change over to how are we going to evaluate uh, Governor Murphy's order? You know uh, last March and then evaluate the same order say today if you know if each one was still in place or the ones that are still in place, knowing what we know now, um, does it become a um should we be looking at it through a different lens i guess you know and that i'll give that to you elon to unpack a little bit yeah it also relates to some of the questions actually that i see in the q a so i'm going to try to um connect a few of these points 
Uh, first, look, I agree with Matt as a general matter when we're dealing with policy questions. Uh, who, who's to say, you know, why should a judge get involved? Which is why when it's a legislature and it doesn't involve a written constitutional limit or a fundamental right to the extent those are different, some people think they are, uh, then I think judges, you know, should appropriately defer. But when, again, it's one person acting alone, yeah, of course he's taking advice. There's no doubt about that. And of course he's trying to do the right thing. But when it's one person acting alone, affecting people's rights, right? And maybe it's not a written constitutional right, uh, but some people think the right to earn a living is pretty fundamental to them, right? Uh, then, you know, uh, who's to adjudicate uh, that tension uh, between a general policy that has a particularly devastating impact uh, on gyms? or bar owners or whoever. And it's not obvious to me that judges don't have a role and shouldn't, shouldn't get involved. And here I will say though, Matt point, I was prepared for that in my lawsuit, which is why I said, also if there's an express constitutional provision, which the privileges or immunities clause is, that is exactly when judges have to uh, evaluate claims of police power and okay, but wait, but are you being discriminatory? And is it a reasonable discrimination? And so we argued both, right? That it's one person acting alone, and we have an express constitutional prohibition. And for both reasons, you know, we think the rational basis test uh, uh, shouldn't apply. Um, and by the way, in terms of like the a year ago versus today, this goes to uh, appropriately named uh, Mr. Jacobson's question uh, in the in the Q&A, uh, where this is sort of what we argued. At one point, is it no longer an emergency? I mean, it's one thing to say, OK, there's an impending hurricane. Everybody stay home, you know, shelter in place, mobilize resources. Uh, fine. The hurricane comes, supposedly there's a lot of damage, you can keep a state of emergency, marshal the personnel of the state, you know. Uh, and But what our governor has done, and at least in Arizona, I think is akin to declaring an emergency because we're anticipating a very bad hurricane season. And it's like, okay, maybe we will have a bad hurricane season, but I don't think that means you get to keep your powers for a full year. It just, it's at some point, it's no longer an emergency because the threat is no longer emergent. As as Jeff Jacobson says here in the, in the Q and A, and and I agree with that. I think I think that's a, a a fair, a totally fair point. Um, and and since I I have the microphone, I'll also uh, answer uh, Eric's last question about the legislature being involved. The fact that they can override a veto, I don't think means that they have the power to be involved. It, it completely shifts the burden. You need two thirds of you know of both houses to override a veto. By the way, Matt, do you still have a legislative veto? Is that still allowed? under New Jersey, do you know? Because there's a, there's a case from New Jersey in the 1980s that the governor's lawyer here kept citing, which really annoyed me, where uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court said, there's no problem with the delegation of emergency powers because the state legislature can terminate the emergency by concurrent resolution, right, without the governor. But this was decided before INS v. Chata. So I think that would be an unconstitutional legislative veto. Uh, and so I just wonder if yeah. there's been further case law on that in New Jersey, uh, there there was a Supreme Court. Really annoyed me. Ryan may want to handle this because it was, the, or maybe even Jeff Jacobson wants to hop in here to handle this because it was in the last administration that was litigated up. But yeah, there is a, um, a legislative veto for regulatory actions. Um, you know, uh, but that yeah, that's sort of a, a, a different, different question, but I, uh, I'm surprised that they're citing New Jersey case law in your hours on the case. But. I was too. Yeah. I'm frustrated. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I don't know if you want, are we wrapping or I don't know how you, you if you want me to just sort of give a reaction. Yeah, I think it would be, exactly. Yeah, Matt, give, give, give your reaction and then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys each a, you know, another minute or two. And then, um, you know, I think unfortunately that'll be the time that we have. Yeah, look, I think, I think Jeff's, question is is a good one of when does the emergency end that's sort of it, I, I can assure you there would be no happier person on the planet uh, at least in new jersey than governor murphy to end the state of emergency i think if you look back at the last administration because it would mean we're past the pandemic um and frankly these are exhausting days when we were doing seven days a week uh press conferences you know we would often be writing the orders through the night and somehow i got roped into going to every press conference so they were one o'clock i'd be at every press conference at one o'clock um, and, you know, up until one o'clock, we were writing the order and then you start again for the next day. Um, so, you know, no one will be sad when when that stops. Um, 
But, you know, it's a good question. Like, and it's a fact specific question. And it goes to the question about like, should courts view things differently? I think the answer is yes. And I think they have as the, as the pandemic has evolved, as we've learned more, I think the quote unquote rational basis test that's being applied is really a question of is what the governor did consistent with his statutory authority and does it further an effort to protect the health, safety and welfare? If there's not really a good defense to that second question, and if you're seeing us drawing arbitrary lines that really aren't defensible, I think you've seen cases of loss. I'm not surprised that the governor revoked the order in Arizona when he did. We certainly wouldn't have done that. So I think that is a clear difference than where we were last March or April when it was you were allowed to shut everything down. Um, I'm not sure that that would that would stand up today. I mean, as cases creep up potentially, but um, you know, I think that's a different different question. Um, but when does the emergency end? I think it ends when the facts support that life can resume as normal and we're not in a case where the virus is rapidly spreading. Like I said, we had a sufficient factual basis on March 9th of 2020 to establish a state of emergency with 11 pursued positive cases. We had almost 4,000 today. You know, uh, we, are, we have 550,000 uh, deaths in this country, 25,000 deaths almost in New Jersey alone. I would be hard pressed to think a court is now going to step in and say, no, 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 things are fine. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, I, there are prior state emergencies from past administrations that have never been closed out. Probably because there are some good reasons for why. Sometimes there's a federal requirement if you're doing federal, if there's federal law. But, but now, Ryan, I am sure if, the gov if Governor Murphy stood up and said, I'm going to rely on Governor Christie's Sandy executive orders that were never closed out to you know, do something on the shore we'd be struck down in a heartbeat because there's clearly no more longer an emergency related to Superstorm Sandy from eight years ago. It's why it's a fact-specific inquiry. And I think, I do trust courts. And I think they've been reasonable in approaching these to understand the difference between when are we really past the pandemic and these emergency powers are no longer necessary? And when are we still in the middle of it? And while I may not agree with him, the governor on a policy decision, unless it's affecting a fundamental right, or unless it really can't pass a rational basis review as to how that order affects the disaster response, then I'm going to uphold the order. Uh, and I think that's sort of where the balance is, has fallen. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I think that's the appropriate place. Elon, so what's the, what's the, the solution? I'll give you kind of the, the, the last point uh, here on this. Is it, you know, just to kind of continue to challenge if, if, if folks that are harmed, you know, continue to believe that, you know, either though the order was okay uh, at its inception, at, at some point later, um, it, you know, it just, it, its effectiveness is diluted. Uh, I guess I'll say two things to close out. The first is the solution is not the courts because the courts have um, proven themselves uh, to be cowardly, I think, across the country when it comes uh, to enforcing constitutional have chief executives that care about constitutional principles uh, and who aren't just business people, like at least in our state. Um, uh, but look, I'm being a bit flippant because again, Governor Murphy really believed he was doing the right thing. And, 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 and so, you know, but that, that's where the rubber meets, meets the road, uh, uh, this procedural separation of powers. Uh, and so what's the solution? I don't, I don't know, but it's not going to be found in legislatures and it's not going to be found uh, in courts. And maybe the answer is, as Matt said, it's elections. And if people think Governor Murphy did things wrong or Governor Ducey, then they are subject to elections. And that's true. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to say uh, is um, I think it's so rare to have uh, a debate like this, not just, you know, ACS and FedSoc, but someone who actually was there, you know, in the trenches doing this um, you know, for a, a governor. And so I just wanted to thank Matt for agreeing to do this and for his service uh, to Governor Murphy. And I think what this shows more than anything, and I think this is one I want to leave us with, is as bitter as the controversy on left and right has been for coronavirus, I think just legitimately people on both sides are just trying to figure out what's right. And I think it's important that we remember that, you know, we aren't enemies. Uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're friends and we're all citizens trying to do the right thing, even if we have different perspectives. So I'm just so excited that I was able to be a part of this with Matt today. I'd echo that. And I appreciate well, you having me and, and opening us up to the, this kind of conversation, Ryan. It's, it's important. And like I said, that I do think there across the country, and I'm sure you'll be a part of this, there's 
there's going to be a lot of introspection and, and reflection and analysis as to what worked and what didn't. Um, and if we don't do something like that, we will have missed, I think, a critical opportunity to um, to reform our laws and, and figure out the right way to be responding to these kinds of crises. Hopefully, we never have another pandemic like this, at least in our lifetimes, but there'll be something. So, Well said. Well, thank you both. Um, on behalf of uh, on behalf of our chapter, um, and behalf of the federal side as whole, uh, I agree um, with both of your remarks, and I think that it's uh, it's very rich and very rewarding to have a conversation, particularly um, from both you two who uh, are leading experts in this field um, at a very timely um, time. And so, uh, thank you again, and uh, I hope you all have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ryan.